We welcome you to the ANU International Law Society Career Series, Unraveling International Law. We acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, traditional custodians of the land on which this interview is recorded. We pay our respects to Elders past and present, as well as any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers. We hope you enjoy episode one. My name is Angelique Nellis and I'm the Careers Director of the ANU International Law Society. We are hitting the ground running by having a very special guest join us today for our first episode of our Careers video series. She has reached the upper echelons of the Australian and international sphere with an array of notable achievements including being regarded as one of Australia's finest ministers for foreign affairs. She truly requires no introduction. On behalf of the ANU International Law Society, I would like to welcome the the current Chancellor of the Australian National University, the incredible, the legendary, the Honourable Julie Bishop. <laughs> thank you very much for joining us today. Well, thank you for that delightful introduction. <laughs> it's a joy to be with you. So what were your passions as a law student and what inspired you to focus on a career in law, or public service and international? I don't recall what precisely prompted me to consider law as a career but I know from about the age of 14 I wanted to be a lawyer and so on leaving school I gained admission to Adelaide University Law School and I had a great time there. Mm. I think I had far too much fun in <laughs> retrospect but my interest in international law was evident at that time. I recall doing a major essay on uh, the Warsaw Pact at the time, so I had a great passion for international law. And I was terribly interested in international affairs and Australia's place in the world. I remember when I had earned enough money as a young student, my sister and I went overseas on our first overseas trip and we travelled through Southeast Asia and I was hooked. I thought that travelling to different cultures, different nations, hearing different languages was one of the most exciting things you could mm. do. So somewhere in the back of my mind I wanted to be involved in international law. In fact when I completed my law degree and I was tossing up whether to do articles or would I do something else, yeah. I actually had an interview at the Department of Foreign Affairs <laughs> and <laughs> Trade and I didn't take up the idea of going into the diplomatic corps, sure. I went into legal practice but clearly I had a passion for foreign policy international affairs at that young age. Wow that's fantastic and um, given that you know you were able to travel and kind of experience the the, the world as it is would you say that um, traveling is is really important to kind of get that um, experience and leading on to that what tips would you maybe have for ANU students who are wanting a career in, in the international sphere? Well, first, I actually drew on my experience as a student and later when I did some study as a mature age student at Harvard um, Business School, mm -hmm. I drew on those experiences and the world that opened up before me as a result of those experiences to introduce the new Colombo plan when I was foreign minister. Mm -hmm. And that was because I wanted Australian undergraduates to have the opportunity to live and study and hopefully work in a country in our region so that during their undergraduate years they could spend time in another country, immerse themselves in the language, the culture, the political and social life and come back to Australia with new perspectives and insights and hopefully networks and friendships that would last a lifetime. Mm -hmm. So by the time I resigned as Foreign Minister, I think the new Colombo plan had assisted about 40,000 Australian undergraduates to spend some time living and studying overseas. And that was very much based on my experience of what I'd learned and what I'd experienced um, traveling, mm -hmm. living, studying overseas. And I would certainly encourage students to do that, COVID permitting, obviously. It's yes. going to be a bit challenging at yeah. present. Yeah. I think that uh, my drive and passion came from my parents who essentially let me believe that I could do anything I set my mind to. There was no magic to it, it was hard work. But it was also um, a belief that I shouldn't let others define who I am or what I could achieve. I was encouraged to set my own high standards and then work very hard to achieve yes. them. Oh, that's wonderful. And I was watching one of your interviews and where you said, I don't want people to label me, but rather the work 
I wanted to uh, I want to be defined by the work that I do. I think and so. I I, think I've never I've never been into labels or people declaring that they're this or that. Yeah. I think people should be judged by not their self description but by what they do, what they do. and mm. I hope that that was my legacy in in foreign affairs definitely the work that I did in the Pacific in the Indo-Pacific and elsewhere and of course the new Colombo plant yeah yeah and actually during on to that maybe we can have a bit more of a different focus and now go on to um, the international realm that you have had experience in um, and first focusing on the past role that you had um, so having had your international accreditation cemented um, during your time as Australian Foreign Minister how do you feel your relationships with the international community played a role in finding a solution during quite challenging international law or international relation events? I think one of the um, benefits of being Australia's foreign minister is that our country is very highly regarded on the world stage. Mm. Uh, people want to hear Australia's view, our perspective, our insights. And so it was a an immense privilege to be foreign minister of a nation as highly regarded as Australia. Uh, but I worked very hard to develop relationships with my counterpart, um, foreign secretary, foreign minister, secretary of state, uh, with friends and those who might not be considered friends of Australia, because you never knew when that personal connection would uh, be of use to Australia in pursuing our interests. And there were many times when I would I find myself in a challenging position promoting Australia's position and then took the opportunity to text or call my foreign minister counterpart and say can we discuss this can we sort this out and I found that to be invaluable so mm. they're also connections that I've maintained to this day and I find myself sometimes on the same panel or seminar okay. or, or Zoom workshop yeah, yeah. with other foreign ministers whom I know from my time in Parliament so they're very valuable and I think that they've been well I can think of many occasions when my personal connection with my counterpart hopefully smoothed the way to get a better outcome. Mm, and so emphasising on the personal human side and, and the relations to all of that can, that can sometimes be quite forgotten in the very political um, world that we find ourselves in but I definitely think that's something that's very important and during your tenure I know that you were very, you were widely acclaimed for your handling of the downing of MH17 mm. um, and definitely that's something quite personal to me because I flew on that flight a week um, before and so I was wondering given um, what were the global challenges that you felt you faced and, and as a result, what did you learn more about um, international law in, in that scope? You must replay that incident in your mind over and over again that you yeah. were on that Malaysian Liz. flight a week earlier. Yeah. Well, tragically, 298 passengers and crew were killed aboard Malaysian Airlines MH17 when it left Amsterdam on its way to Malaysia and then on to Australia. And 38 Australian residents and citizens including children, were on board that flight. Uh, we needed a United Nations Security Council resolution to give the grieving nations, those who had citizens aboard, the legal foundation to enter Ukraine, where the plane was shot down, and uh, repatriate the bodies, and also a basis for the investigations that took place thereafter. Uh, there is absolutely no doubt that this commercial airline was shot down um, in the conflict between eastern Ukraine and Russia by Russian-backed separatists, a book missile. But the, you know, the investigation continues. So we were able to achieve that UN Security Council resolution, a unanimous resolution, and that was mm. a challenge given that Russia was a permanent member of the Security Council and could have vetoed at any time, but we got a unanimous resolution in record time, like literally within days. And then in Ukraine, we had to get the Ukrainian parliament to change its constitution to enable armed Australian Federal Police and others onto the crash site because it's against their constitution to allow in armed foreign forces. And uh, that was going swimmingly until we found that the Ukraine parliament had gone on summer leave. And so I had to act as a government whip to get uh, enough Ukrainian members of parliament to return 
to Kiev to pass one piece of parliamentary business, that was the resolution involving MH17. Can you imagine a foreign minister from overseas turning up in Canberra <laughs> saying, would you mind recording Just the parliament? We need a, you know, <laughs> so I forever pay tribute to the, those Ukrainian wow. members of parliament who came back, about three or 400 of them, to create a quorum for us to do that. We also did not have a diplomatic presence in Kiev at that time. So in record time, Australia was able to establish in a hotel in Kiev, uh, a mission with about 45 public servants from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Department of Defence, uh, Attorney General's, Prime Minister's Office, and about 200 defence and AFP personnel. We were able to set that up like a pop-up embassy virtually overnight, and they were able to assist in the recovery of the bodies and the investigations. None of that would have been possible had uh, we not been able to rely on international law mm. and our friends and partners and supporters around the world who um, enabled that to take place. And I was forever grateful to the members of the UN Security Council at that time mm. for backing the Dutch-Australian resolution. And, and being a Dutch citizen and Australian citizen myself, I really appreciated all the, all the work that you especially um, did um, in that regards. And another thing that you did in November 2014, you chaired the Security Council leading meetings in regards to threats of foreign fighters, UN peacekeeping and the Ebola epidemic. What was your biggest takeaway in, in taking um, from that experience? Well, it was interesting. I was appointed foreign minister in September of 2013 okay. and within days I was in the Security Council chairing the Security Council because Australia under Kevin Rudd had obtained a um, two-year spot, a temporary spot on the UN Security mm. Council yep. and so I was there presiding over the Security Council. It was a real pinch me moment. There I am with the gavel in my hand you know telling the UK foreign minister to sit down and the UN representative from the, uh, the US come to water, come to water. So that was a, a surreal moment. Mm -hmm. And then we had another opportunity to preside over the Security Council in November of 2014. Yeah. I think it was yeah. just before our term came to an end. And Australia is a very active player on the, on the international stage, including at the United Nations. And so being able to promote matters of concern to Australia, promote our national interest, our agenda mm -hmm. in that environment was very significant. Yeah, yeah. And um, given that, yes, you were a fantastic um, foreign affairs minister, but you've also moved on to do some, take part in some amazing ventures. I know that um, you're the 2021 Kissinger Fellow, so congratulations. Thank you. For yeah, that. That's a, that's a fellowship set up in uh, the name of Henry Kissinger, mm. who is still alive and well and as sharp and entertaining <laughs> as ever, uh, at the McCain Institute, which was an institute set up in honour of the late Senator yes. John McCain. Yeah. And its academic home is at Arizona State University and it is an institute, a think tank in Washington. Wow. And so I'm the 2021 Kissinger Fellow. And in that role, I have uh, the opportunity to do three research projects that the McCain Institute then mm. presents to the um, US administration. And I'm focusing on US leadership in the Indo-Pacific, on a strategy for sustainability in the Pacific, and thirdly, on the elimination of modern slavery and human trafficking and people smuggling, forced labour, child labour and the like, which was a, a matter of great concern and passion um, when I was Foreign Minister and we introduced and passed the Modern Slavery Act. We were the second country yeah. after the United Kingdom to introduce such legislation. Wow, and so you're conducting that research and... and yeah. I'm doing that while now. we're speaking so a lot on your plate but um, given that background that you have those those areas um, or, and themes that you're researching and I think this will be our, our final question but what do you believe is the trajectory of international law in, in Australia and maybe the wider Indo-Pacific um, region? It's an exceedingly challenging time for international law because the rules-based order is under challenge uh, in some areas around the world. 
Now, the international rules-based order was that framework of treaties and conventions and protocols underpinned by international law that evolved after the Second World War and it was designed to prevent a third global conflict. Yeah. So international law and the rules-based order is designed to manage relations within and between states to prevent conflict. Sure. And to an extent, it's been successful that there hasn't been a third world war. Mm. But we find that some nations pick and choose the parts of the rules-based order that apply to them, they cherry pick. Um, in some places it's under threat, in other places it's under strain. And I believe that countries that have, have benefited from that rules-based order, including Australia, uh, through uh, peace, prosperity, security, they should be the defenders and advocates for adherence to that rules-based order. So the United Nations and its associated bodies is not perfect. Mm. But if it didn't exist, we'd have to create it. And so I think that there's plenty of work for energetic, enthusiastic, passionate advocates for international law to help work on restoring, maintaining, protecting the international rules-based order. Yeah. Chancellor, I want to thank you for taking the time to, to meet the ANU International Law Society. As a long admirer of your accomplishments and leadership, it's been a privilege and has really provided a fresh perspective and I'm sure a lot of ANU law students will definitely find it useful. Thank you. So thank you once, a once again and have a wonderful afternoon.